just covered there in the, in the previous section the, all the problems with least squares. There's quite a few issues with that, like missing data, the, the type correlation between columns and X, and so on. And we're going to show you now in principal components regression, just a few slides, how PCR actually solves the vast majority of those problems with a very simple procedure. Uh, unfortunately, the software that we're using for this course does not have principal components regression in it. But you are able to easily do principal components regression by, uh, by the process I'll just I'll describe next. Uh, so we actually will cover PCR more as a conceptual topic. We won't actually implement it, but it's a stepping stone towards P and PLS. Okay. So principal components regression overcomes all the problems from these squares, or certainly many of the problems from these squares, as follows. It says take your X matrix, which has missing data, which has very correlated variables, has a lot of noise in it, and calculate PCA, which we've, we've covered in the, in the first few classes so far and reduce those k columns from x to just a few columns, a. Still the same number of rows, a. That's step one. So this is a step you can easily do in the software. Step two, you may have to use a different software package. Copy and paste your scores out into a different program and just build a multiple linear regression model from your scores, t, to your y variable. This is step two. So they're happening totally independent of each other. Step two happens sequential to step one. And in step two, what you do is you're building a model that relates your Y's to your T's this time. And when you calculate that regression coefficients for this multiple linear model, I'll still call them B. This time though, they're calculated as T transpose T and this T transpose Y. Or in other words, we're regressing Y onto the scores T to get the regression coefficients B. So this solves the vast majority of those issues. And here's why. Firstly, the T is orthogonal. Matrix T is in the columns from one column to the next, but totally independent of each other. So as Shafani said, we've got linearly independent columns now. Previously in Equip, we might have linearly dependent. The T's are guaranteed to be linearly independent or orthogonal would be another way of saying that. So T transpose T can very easily be inverted. So T transpose T is, let's just take T1 transpose T1. We showed in the last, uh, or a few classes back, that's related to the eigenvalue one. T transpose T2 for the second component is proportional to the second eigenvalue, etc. We also know that Ti is orthogonal to Tj for the case when I is not equal to J. So in other words, T transpose T inverse looks as follows. It's just one over the eigenvalue from the first component, one over the eigenvalue from the second component, down the diagonals. And we have zeros, in fact, in the off diagonal. So it's a very simple inversion. You can do it by hand once you've got your eigenvalues. Or, or you can calculate them also as the variances of the scores. And just put the inversion of that on the diagonals and zeros on the off diagonals. So that's T transpose T inverse. Then you just multiply that by T transpose Y to get your regression coefficients. You never have to reduce the size of your X matrix. Remember, in multiple linear regression, what sometimes what people sometimes do for the case where you've got n and k, for the case where n is smaller than k, what people will do is they'll just pick columns from x that they feel are most predictive of y. So they'll maybe take that column, take that column, take that column, and a fourth column. Now they've gone from k columns down to four columns, and then they'll satisfy this constraint, and now they'll have n greater than k, and then they can go use multiple linear regression. But that's suboptimal. How do you know which columns should I pick? Okay, There's many combinations, and I don't have to pick four, I could pick six, or eight, or, or five, and whatever choice I make for the number of columns to use, I've got infinitely many permutations of, of how I can get that. 
okay? Well, not infinitely many, but certainly a very large number. So it's not even something I can automate. With principal components regression, you've already reduced T down to a much, much smaller number of columns A. And so you're, much, you're going to have, you're likely going to meet this criteria to have N greater than A. For principal components regression now, remember as we're saying, we need N greater than A. That's very likely to be true because your number of columns A that captures all the variation in X is easily going to be met. We can also calculate PCA and calculate those scores T if there's missing data in X. So we don't have to worry about missing data anymore. Our T's will never have missing values in it. Guaranteed, PCA will always be able to calculate scores T even if you have missing data in X. And so when we go and do the multiple linear regression step in the second phase, we will never see missing data. T also has much less error than X. Okay, those scores, T, are a summary of the data in X. And remember, when we go to the multiple linear regression step here, in step two, one of the implicit assumptions for multiple linear regression is that your input data has no error. Okay, we're not going to meet that exactly with the principal components regression, but certainly the error in T is a whole lot less than the error in X. Okay, that's because the T's are a linear combination of the data in X given by the loadings P. And when we calculate that linear combination, X1 times P1 plus X2 times P2 plus X3 times P3, etc., in order to get us our T value, that linear combination, the errors in the raw data in X, kind of cancel out, so they get smeared out and, and become much smaller than the error in, in, uh, in So the error in X, rather, is, is, is going to be greater than the error we see in T. So we'll never be able to meet the criteria exactly with no error in T, but we're definitely going to reduce that problem a whole lot. To me, also, the best part is, that in fact, the consistency check that we get for free from PCA. If I want to use my principal components regression model in the future, what I do is as follows. I center and scale my raw data in the usual way for PCA. Nothing's changed. That first PCA step is, you can do it already in your sleep. You take your x mu, multiply it by p, and you get t. So you get your t mu. Once you get t mu, you can calculate, I've left out a step here, I've some slides. You calculate x hat mu is equal to t mu <coughs> tp transpose. Okay. So step three that I've missed out over here, should be inserted rather than step three. X mu hat is equal to T mu times P transpose. So this is a A by K matrix, and this is a so one by A vector, and that gives you X mu, which is one by K. And that's a really ugly way of writing it, so I'd rather write X mu is equal to P times T mu. So that's K by A, a by 1 gets me a K by 1 prediction of X. Okay. Then I calculate my residuals. E is equal to X minus X nu. Okay. And then once I have my residuals, I calculate my SPE. So, <laughs> I don't know why I have done all those steps. So then SPE nu function of E. So you just take the sum of squares. And now you can go check, is my new SPE smaller than the 99 or 95% limit from the PCA model that I built in step one? And is my T squared mu, which is T squared is just a function of the T's, is that below the 95 or 99% limit when I built my model? If both SPE mu and T squared mu are below the limit, then I go ahead and do the second step, and I can go ahead to the multiple linear regression step. But if any one of these, SPE mu or T squared mu, are above the, their respective limits, it says, hang on, your point is either off the plane, or it's way out on the plane, or both. 
So any further step, proceeding with step two, is you're at risk. I'm, yeah, sure, I can go ahead, of course, nothing's stopping me to go to step two and say T nu multiplied by V from the MLR step. Nothing's preventing me from getting my prediction, but at least before I go ahead and do that, I've got something that's gonna tell me, no, maybe there's something wrong because your SPE is way off the plane or your T squared is way out. There's something that's really not so right with your X new data. Okay, so least squares doesn't do this for you at all. Least squares, you just go straight from X and get your prediction for Y. Principal components regression is much more uh, detailed. There's a few more steps you have to do. You have to go first center and scale your X, multiplied by P's to get your T's. Get your T multiplied by P to get X hat, X hat. Go to get your residuals for the for the uh, vector. Calculate SPE nu, calculate T squared nu. Do some checks, and then you go get your prediction. So all after all those steps, you only get your prediction. But it's a safety net. At least if your SPE nu and T squared nu are below the respective limits, you can be sure about your prediction. You've got much more a certainty that that prediction is going to be reasonable. It's not, at least in the case of like garbage in, garbage out, in this case, yes, you put garbage in, something's going to warn you. It says, hang on, don't go ahead and make your prediction. Okay? And that prevents these cases. For example, what would the SPE be for this point over here? For the red star. Negative small. Okay, firstly, let's ask this way. Look at the relationship between x1 and x2. Okay, so x1 and x2 clearly are correlated. Where would your loadings and your scores direction be? If you had to fit a simple PCA to x1 and x2, what would, what would the loading be? We'd just go right through this point and say that's my direction that best fits the data. And you only have one component for these two variables. So yeah, I've got k is equal to two for this illustration. A, the number of components in a model, is only going to be one because this x1 and x2 clearly are, are correlated. So that distance over there represents my SPE. That SPE distance is much greater than the SPE distance from any of my other training data. Okay, so if I had to bring this point in, into my model, in step one of the principal components regression, PCR, I would stop because SPE nu would be really high. SPE nu would be much, much greater than SPE limit, whatever that limit value is, okay? So SPE, in this case, would, would catch the problem with this data. T, this point will likely have a T squared value that's within the limit. But its SPE will be really high. And so that will prevent me from going to step two of principal components regression and actually make the prediction. Is that clear? That, that illustration? It's a very simple illustration, but that's, that's a good way to, to see what the PCR is doing. Okay. And the other thing that you can uh, prove to yourself is if you go ahead and in the PCA step use the number of components instead of using A as determined by cross validation which you would normally do but you go force extra components so you go add more than the software would normally let you by autofit add the maximum number of components possible K so now your T matrix over here you now have basically expanded T to be much wider than it normally would be. You've now got K columns in T. Your multiple linear regression step, you will get exactly the same performance from that multiple linear regression using the T's as you would have from the X's. Okay? That's, that's quite an interesting result. Basically, it can be explained as follows. These T's are just a rearrangement now of the data in X. Okay? And so when you go and do this next step, multiple linear regression, you'll get the same level of predictions. Your coefficients won't be the same. Your means will not be the same. 
because your columns in T are obviously different from the columns in A. But your re uh, residual sizes and so on will all be um, identical from predicting straight from X to Y versus doing this two-step approach. Okay? So that's principal components regression in a, in a very short, um, short description. And there's about all I'm going to say on the topic. The, um, the advantages far outweigh anything we have from least squares. So least squares had a ton of disadvantages. Principal components regression quickly eliminates most of them. We get, we get by all the most of the disadvantages from least squares using PCR. And in fact, you'll see a lot of people use principal components regression instead of PLS because of the com computational simplicity and the conceptual simplicity of it. Once you understand PCA, it's like you, we've basically covered principal components regression in five, 10 minutes. The concept to go from PCA to uh, principal components regression is really, really a very small um, leap. It's not a whole lot of new material you have to understand. So many people are stick to just using PCR. But there is an important reason why you'd want to use PLS rather than PCR. <clears throat> and that's as follows. Because it's a two-step approach, that PCA model that you build in the first step, it's built without any knowledge of why. So when we calculate those PCA components up here, this PCA model only sees the X matrix. It has no idea that these scores are going to be used later on for multiple linear regression. Okay? So these scores are not necessarily the best choice of scores to use to make a prediction for Y. Okay? In fact, what you'll often find is you have to use more components than you normally would have from order of the cross validation because the components here in T are calculated purely with one objective in mind. What's that? To explain, sorry? Yeah, to explain X. So these scores are, are built to explain X that were never intended to be used to explain Y. Okay? So they may not be the best choice of scores, and so when cross-validation stops, it says this is the best number of columns to use, A, in order to explain X. It's not actually the best number of columns to use to explain Y. So what people do then is they go add additional components beyond what order fit tells. So if order fit says stop after three components, go add four, five, six, or seven, and use more components than you normally would have in the multiple linear regression step. And then proceed to predict one. That's because we're doing step one and step two sequentially. So that, this step here is not just done without the knowledge of why. And so we go add additional components beyond the usual one of the parts. That really makes it hard to interpret the principal components regression model. Um, if you're trying to go and understand, well, what is the relationship between my x variables and my y variables? It's really hard. Let's try to conceptually do that. If I've got a situation where I'm I've got a single y variable here, okay, and I built my multiple linear regression model using my scores t. Those scores that come from a PCA model are my x scale with, with k columns. Okay. Now, when I calculate my multiple linear regression model over here, I'm getting a regression coefficient vector b which has A entries. So B1, B2, up to BA. And let's say I see that B2 and B3 really have large coefficients relative to the coefficients in B1 and the others. How can I relate that back to my X matrix. That's the, ultimately what you want to do. You're trying to understand why over here 
And let's say this is conversion from your reactor, given a variety of variables. I want to understand what is it about the variables in X that leads to higher conversions over here in Y. Because I want to make money in my post, so I want to make more money for my company so I can get a raise. So in order to do that, I want to figure out, well, which of these columns here in X are going to, if I change them, improve my Y value. Okay? So you work backwards. You say, well, to get a higher Y value, you obviously go and change the corresponding input variables to your multiple linear regression, which in this case a score is T. Okay, so you've got T1, T2, etc., up to TA. And so you go look at your regression coefficients here and to B, and you see that B2 and B3 are much bigger than B1, B3, uh, B4, B5, and so on. So really it's telling you I don't need to focus too much on the other Bs, B2 and B3, in other words, T2 and T3 are the variables that I need to focus on. Okay. How can I go from that now back to my X matrix and figure out which X variables are important? Look at the loadings, right? So you now have to go look up, go back to your PCA software and look at the loadings matrix P over here and see, well, here's P2 and here's P3 and look at the variables in those two vectors that have high weights, high, high loadings, to try and figure out, well, what is it that increases why. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a messy process to do it. And you may get conflicting results because there might be a large positive coefficient in P2 for this variable, but there could be a large negative coefficient for P3 in that variable. So then what do you do? Okay, it's, a, it's a, so it's not, it's not an intuitive and it's not certainly not straightforward and if you've got many coefficients here which are large, that's not going to help you either. And also what's not going to help is this fact here, that you've already gone and added more components beyond what's normally required. In other words, you've gone and added noisy components. You've expanded the A matrix to have more components than normal, and those components that have gone beyond A are noisier than you would normally see. So can you trust those loadings? Do they actually mean anything? Can you believe the results you're seeing when you look back at your loading vector? Okay, so you can see how this quickly, uh, if you're trying to learn from your model, can become quite messy. Okay. Is, that, is that clear? Yeah, should find So when you're saying your B is large, you're saying that the slope of that line is really large. Yeah. Whereas the slope that's close to zero indicates that variable really has no influence on the y. So if this b was, was roughly zero, I could have just deleted it from the model. The other way to seeing it is that the data contained in that first column corresponding to b1 might as well just have been random numbers. There's no real influence of that variable onto y. And the only reason why we can do this with principal components regression, I didn't mention this earlier, is because t is orthogonal. Normally we cannot go independently interpret the b's if our data in the input data to multiple linear regression is non-orthogonal. We cannot go and interpret the b's like I've done here. But because the columns in b are orthogonal, yes, it's absolutely correct to go and say a large b means it's going to have more of an influence on the y than a smaller b. That's what we're trying to. That's what I'm trying to uh, argue here. Is that it's hard to say. Okay, sure. We've now established that B2 and B3, let's say, for example, are the biggest coefficients. How do we relate that back to the raw data X? We have to then go through the loadings and, and look at those. And once we start to look at the loadings, we may might see conflicting information there as well. So it's not that straightforward. So well, the point is that principal components regression. Sure, it meets a whole lot of uh, or gives us a whole lot of advantages over multiple linear regression, but I see these as two pretty big disadvantages, or they really are just one big disadvantage kind of split up into two concepts. The interpretability part is hard from a pre 
principal components regression model. That's why I don't want to really cover it in the software, but certainly uh, I know that this is very widely used, especially in the chemistry community. Uh, but from a process point of view, where you really want to understand your relationships between X and Y, you really want a model that can go from X to Y all in one go. You don't want this two-step approach. So this two-step approach is really the cause of this problem. Because when we do the step one, the PCA, it's being done without knowledge of why. Wouldn't it be great if we can make those scores in T have some relationship with Y when we build the PCA model? Okay, can you see where this is going? We really like to develop those scores in T so that when we calculate them, those scores actually incorporate some, thing, some information about the Y variable. Um, the other advantage, actually you should add a third one here, is that we cannot do PCR for more than one Y variable. Okay, PCR, because it's using as step two a multiple linear regression, we have to use only one column of Y. So if we had several Y columns, we'd have to repeat this entire procedure for every Y column. So principal components regression, one column at a time only in the Y space. So that would be a third disadvantage. So where we're going with this is we've looked at multiple linear regression, two blocks of data. There's a number of problems with that. Principal components regression gets us a whole lot further. But some disadvantages of interpretability, and you cannot have more than one column. Principal uh, projection to latent structures, PLS, or partial least squares. There's two names, partial least squares and projection to latent structures. I'll talk a bit about that later. That's what we're going to look at next. Okay, so I'm going to skip over the review because we've done that. So, yeah, wouldn't it be great if we can go calculate these scores T? so that it uses information from both blocks simultaneously. In the future, sure, we don't have both X and Y. In the future, we only have X. We want to then get our T and then go from T to get Y, predicted. Okay, that's what we're talking about in the future when we're going to use the model. But when we build the model, we really want both the X and the Y space to contribute simultaneously to the calculation of that score. And if we can do that, we'll have some real advantages. We'll be able to build a model on the Y space using multiple columns in Y, because we're going to use all of the Y variables now to build to calculate those scores. And we're going to be able to use a model with often with fewer components, because those components we are going to calculate, those T's, are going to be directly related to X and Y simultaneously. So we should get fewer components and it should be easier to interpret, so we won't have this mess back here, the principal components regression. Okay. okay, so where we're, this is where we're headed, so I'll, I'm just going to put this out here now, we'll, we'll come fill in the details. That's what today's class is. Today's class might be frustrating to you, it's going to be some new concepts that you don't quite get, you're not going to understand certain plots and certain matrices perhaps, don't feel worried. We're going to come back and fill in the details in future classes. In fact, today's class is probably one of the last major theory classes. Every other class from now on is more and more application of PCA and PLA. So the, the details will, will get filled in. So what we're going to do is I'm going to show you today how exactly like PCA, we calculate our PLS model one component at a time. We'll calculate T1, then we'll deflate. Then we'll calculate T2, then deflate, calculate T3, and then deflate. So we'll build out this T matrix sequentially. We'll use cross-validation to calculate what A should be. I'm not going to cover that today. The scores, this is the key concept, the scores in T are calculated from X and Y simultaneously. And that often makes sense from an engineering perspective because this is critical. We're saying the assumption is our process is actually generated or driven around by the scores. We just don't have a sensor that can measure T1. We don't have a T1 sensor or a T2 sensor. These T's are the cause of our process. What we measure after the fact goes in X and Y. 
we measure the temperatures, we measure the concentration, we measure the spectrum, we measure the outcome, good or bad, of our process. But that's a result of the cores going here on in T. But we just don't have the capability to measure these Ts. So when we build the model, we're going this way. But the cause and effect direction is this way. The scores, the latent variable directions, cause the x values and the y values. We're going to cal back calculate what those Ts would have been. Okay, so this is a critical, <laughs> critical point to understand. Okay, so PCA, just to come back to PCA. We always come back to PCA. PCA is, as I said at the start of the class, that's the mother of all multivariate methods. So it's going to be our baseline. The objective function for PCA, best explanation of the Y space. Okay. PLS is objective. Does three things. We want to explain that X space. We want to explain the Y space. And we want to maximize the relationship between the x and the y space. I'm going to show you how we can achieve all three things simultaneously. We want to get really understand and be able to predict x and x hat for our x space. We want to get y, and we obviously want to get y hat for our y space. But we also want to make sure that the relationship between x and y is as strong as possible. Maximize that relationship. So I'm going to put this English into mathematics in a minute and show you what that, what that comes out as. So just some new notation. The X matrix, which we know well by now, N rows, K columns. We're going to calculate scores, T, with A columns and T. Those scores, we generally say, come from the X space or are, are associated with the X space. We're going to use some new notation for the loadings. What would have been called the loadings P, I'm going to use W and call them weights now instead. So the weights for the X matrix and it scores T for the X matrix. And the relationship between W and T and X is the same as a PCA. The only difference is we're calling it W. And you'll see why. For the Y space, we've got M columns. So that's some new notation. We're not considering just one column in Y, we're considering multiple columns in Y. So M could be one, but more often than not, it's more than one. We're going to generate scores for the Y space, and I'm going to call those U. So there's U1, U2 in the second column, U3 up to UA. So the same number of scores for the X space, T, as many columns there are for the scores in T, they're the same number of scores for the Y space, which I'll call U. So those two dimensions in the column space, T and U, are the same. And my loadings for the Y space, I'm going to call those C. Okay. So C is, a, is a, an M by A matrix, because I've drawn it as transpose as an A by M. But normally, C is stored as an M by A. W is stored as a K by A matrix, but here I've illustrated as an A by K. Same as the loadings, P, the P matrix for PCA is normally a K by A matrix, but we're just showing it as the transpose. Okay. So, let's take a look at the geometric interpretation first before we go and look at the details of it. So back to these usual diagrams. I'm going to consider the trivial case with three variables in x, x1, x2, x3. And for illustration, I'm going to use three columns in y as well. y1, y2, y3. And each data point corresponds to a row in x. And associated with that row in x is a row in y. Okay, so there's n rows in x. There's also n rows in y. So there's n, n dots in this illustration in the x side and n take endpoints in this particular illustration on the y side. Okay, and I've already mean sense of the data. So the, the data at the central point is this pink or purple point at the, at the origin. The first component for PLS does exactly what you would think it would do. It goes through the cloud of data so that it finds a direction that best explains 
the respective spaces. So this component in the X space, which we've called W1, this would have been like the loadings from PCA. This component W1 goes in a direction in X so that it best explains X. Or I should phrase it more carefully. It explains X well. It doesn't necessarily best explain X. It explains X well. It's not the best possible explanation of X, but it explains X really well. The component direction in the Y space does the same. It explains this direction, which we call C1, is a vector in the Y space that points in the direction that explains it well, uh, that data well. So those, those, those two vectors are found. And I remember I said that there's a third criteria that PLS is trying to do. Not only are we trying to explain X well and, and Y well, we're actually finding these direction vectors so that the relationship between the X space and the Y space is maximized. Let me try to quantify that geometrically. When we're trying to maximize the relationship between two spaces, one way is to proceed as follows. For every data point here along this direction, project that onto the line orthogonally. So project that point along the line and calculate that corresponding distance from the origin, which we call T1 for that data point. Calculate T1 for this data point, T1 for the next data point, and these points over here, they'll have positive T1 values. These points over here will have negative T1 values. So what we'll do then, for the points over there on the X side, we, we're able to calculate quite easily a T1 vector with one entry per data point. And that T1 value for the i-th row represents the distance from the origin to the projection of the point on the line. So that's straightforward. You can, you, you, you know this, this story well. We also go do exactly the same though in the y space. The u1 is calculated in identical manner. The projection of every point onto that vector c1 represents the distance along the line starting from the origin to the point of the projection, and we have one value per entry in the y space. So we have the same number of entries in the t vector and the same number of entries in the u vector. If I'm saying to you in English, I want to maximize the relationships between the two spaces, one way I can try and do that mathematically is as follows. I can say then mathematically, I would like to maximize the covariance between T1 and U1. So remember we spoke about covariance right at the start of the class, this is why. Covariance is defined as the relationship between T1 and U1. Variables that have strong relationship with each other have high covariance. The weaker the relationship between the two variables, the smaller the covariance. PLS is trying to maximize the covariance between T1 and U1. So that direction here is calculated, this W1 direction in the X space is calculated, so it explains the X space well, and the U1 uh, uh, vector, which is calculated from the loadings C1, the C1 direction is calculated, so it explains Y well. But also, that T1, U1, covariance is maximum. So we find, so what PLS is doing is trying to achieve all three things simultaneously. Then there's a deflation step, which I'll talk about in the next few slides. We're going to go ahead and calculate the second component. So the second component, W2, in the X space is calculated so that it is orthogonal to W1. And the second component in the Y space, C2, is calculated there. 
and we calculate for each of W2 and C2, we calculate their corresponding scores, which we call T2 and U2. So repeat the same process again, just for the second component. So the T2 values are projected out to the second direction as shown here for that data point, and this data point over here is P. So that would be the T1 value projected onto C1. The U1 value would be to take that point and project onto the second component to calculate U2. That T2 U2 vector also has maximum covariance. And then the third component goes in exactly the same way. We construct the polygon to the others here in the X space. The Y space we calculate C3. And for this particular illustration, we'd have to stop. You can't fit more than three components to a three dimensional space. But in general, we'll got more columns in our X space, so we can eat, keep adding components there. Okay, so that's the geometric explanation for it. Now, let's come back and formalize it a little bit more mathematically. PCA, we said, has the best explanation of the X space possible. Okay, so the best explanation of X, we found that by maximizing T transpose T, for the eighth component subject to PA transpose PA is equal to one. So there's no other loading direction possible that can that can uh, has a higher TA transpose TA value. So this PA that we find is loading gets us the best possible direction to maximize that objective function. And we can just calculate the variance of TA, which is proportional to TA transpose TA. So some of you have asked me, Kevin come on, you're not being quite accurate here. The TA transpose TA isn't the variance. No, it isn't. It, there's a divide, you have to divide it through by capital N. But it's a constant, so it's, it's not going to change things. So TA transpose TA, sometimes I'll just talk glibly and say that is the variance. It's not quite the variance. It's certainly proportional to it. Okay, so PA, PCA is objective function, maximize TA transpose TA. What PLS does, is very similar. Let's take a look over here on the left hand side for the X space. PLS scores need to explain X. So we say TA is equal to X times W. And we could do that by maximizing TA transpose TA subject to the loadings in the X space being orthogonal by being equal to unit length. We could look at the PLS space, the scores for Y, and in the same way we say U is equal to Y times C, where those U values are found by maximizing U transpose U. So I'm just taking exactly what I did in PCA and I'm applying it to the two spaces, the two blocks X and Y separately. But here's the key part. The PLS also does this third step. It tries to maximize the relationship between X and Y by by following this covariance, by maximizing that covariance. So I'm going to show you how that does three things simultaneously and then we'll take a break. So covariance between T and U is defined by that relationship over there. Another way of saying that is that is equal to or proportional to T1 transpose U. So proportional to T1 transpose U1, or if you want to be exact, it's equal to T1 transpose U1 divided by N, and that's equal to T2 transpose U2 divided by N. But we said covariance is really hard to interpret, so why don't we try and look at correlation instead? Okay? Which is, is, is a lot easier, because those are values between minus one and plus one. One thing we can do then is take a look at correlation, and we said earlier that correlation is equal to the ratio of covariance divided by the individual variances. So in general, for vectors A and B, the covariance divided by the variance of A, square root, divided by the variance of B, square root, that is the correlation between A and B. Just rearranging this equation over here by bringing the denominator up to the left-hand side and rewriting the equation, covariance between vector A and B is the product of three separate quantities. It's the product of the correlation between A and B, it's the 
product of the square root of the variance of A and the square root of the variance of B. Okay. And so if I'm saying to you, I'm maximizing the covariance between the X space score and the Y space score, T and U, I'm really doing three things simultaneously. I am maximizing the correlation between those scores, which is great. I'm maximizing the relationship between the X space scores and the Y space scores in U. But I'm also maximizing the variance of the X space scores, and I'm maximizing the variance of the Y space scores. And if I want to be a bit more explicit about that, variance of the X space scores is T transpose T, and variance of the Y space scores is U transpose U divided by N, and there's a common N in the square roots that take to get that relationship. Okay, so PLS's objective function is to maximize TA transpose UA. PCA's objective function is just to maximize TA transpose TA, but PLS is maximizing the covariance. When it does that, it's really doing three things simultaneously. It's explaining your X space really well, it's explaining the Y space really well, and maximizing the relationship there between x and y given by the correlation. This is critical to understand that it's, it's trying to do all three things at the same time. Okay. So there's the written explanation of the mathematics up there. What I just described to you is, is what's called simple PLS or sim PLS. Uh, the version we'll look at is very, very slightly different. It, in fact, the two are the, the same when you only have a, a single Y, and there's a very, very minor difference in the computation when you've got more than one Y. So from a conceptual point of view, what I've just described, while it's not exactly what we will be doing in the software, will get you through any conceptual understanding you might have. You'll never ever struggle with a conceptual understanding. As long as you realize what PLS is doing is these three things simultaneously. It's trying to explain X well, explain Y well with the views, and explain the correlation between X and Y. How did they explain the correlation between P and U? Like, between? Like the, the first, the last two terms are, like, I can see that perfectly, okay. but the correlation between the D vector and Okay, so when it, these, what I'm saying is, in other words, just come back to the geometric picture here. This, in other words, this direct, what we're really after is finding this direction vector w for the x space so that we then calculate our scores t. And the other search variable we're looking for in the optimization problem is this direction vector c. Okay. So those, those, that's our degree of freedom. We can basically move this component any way we like. And we can move our y component any way we like so that we achieve those three objectives simultaneously. We want to find this direction so that it lines up with the data well in the, in the Y space. It lines up with the data well in the X space. Those are the two concepts that you said you understand. Yeah. T transpose T and U transpose U. But not only do they explain X and Y well, these direction vectors are lined up so that the correlation between the T and the correlation between the U is maximized. Oh, sorry, is, is, is high. So then the product of the three separate terms is maximized. That's, that would be the more correct. Okay, so the correlation is. So can you repeat that? Are you trying to overlap T and U geometrically? You want to maximize the correlation. Because if you maximize the correlation, you'll maximize the covariance. So a real objective, the, the actual mathematical objective is to maximize covariance. To achieve a maximum covariance, we're going to take the product of three positive terms. Okay, so if we can make that term really big, and that term really big, and that term really big, we'll get the maximum possible covariance. So each term is positive. The way to maximize this particular value over here is to maximize all three simultaneously as best we can. This part's easy to explain. We're maximizing the variance explained in the x space, this part here is the variance in the y space, and the first term is the relationship between the scores, the correlation, which we know is a number between minus one and plus one. And we're going to 
always get that number above zero. Okay, we'll never we'll never get that number below zero. So that term is going to. So that number is going to be plus one because of minus minus That's the no. When you're changing it, yeah. If you get them overlapping exactly, you'll get a plus one. But you're never going to get them. Yeah, but you're maximizing this, so the maximum value of the first term can go one. But then this will go down, and that may go down. Right. So there's a trade-off between it. Yeah, you can't. Yes, sure. I could maximize one term, but it's at the expense of the other. So you're trying to achieve all three simultaneously. Okay. That's yeah. That's probably a good a good discussion then. Uh, and we'll often see that in PLS. PLS, your scores here will explain X really well, but they may not explain Y so well, but they'll have an okay correlation. Sometimes you'll see components where, where it's clear that the, ob the objective has been achieved better for one term than the other two terms. But uh, we'll get into that complexity later on. Yeah. Like, I would see it as you're doing both simultaneously. You're calculating the coefficients in W in the weights for the X space. There's an illustration here. You're calculating these coefficients W, this direction vector, and you're calculating this direction vector in the Y space C in the same time so that you maximize that covariance. Remember, as I change this, my T vector is changing. And as I change this direction back to C, my U vector is changing. And so that objective function is changing. So the, the algorithm is searching amongst all possible directions at the same time for W and C so that you get the highest possible covariance. Yes. Yes, the errors are orthogonal, and we'll look at that when we look at the deflation step. 